Awesome. So welcome, everyone. Thank you so much for um, participating in this webinar. This is our first winter webinar for vegetable growers in Utah. And I'm Cami Cannon. I'm the vegetable IPM associate with Utah Pest in the Utah IPM program and with USU Extension as well. And um, one of my main jobs is to provide education and outreach to vegetable growers in Utah to help you incorporate integrated pest management into your management of your vegetables. Um, so today is part one of the pest identification crash, crash course. It's gonna be talking about insect pests of vegetable crops, the most common ones. Um, I'm going to be going pretty quickly because I'm going to try and cover as many as I can. And I tried to use crops that I know you guys are growing based on the survey I sent out a few months ago. Sorry if you didn't get that. I sent it out to my email list. Um, but if I don't cover any pests that you're hoping I would talk about, then you can always email me. I'll send you my email at the end of this webinar. And um, I'll also give you some resources at the end so that um, you can look further into more pests that I didn't talk about or even look further into the ones that I did talk about that you're specifically interested in. Um, so before we start, I want to show you some stuff that I take with me when I monitor for pests in the vegetable gardens. You might take different stuff depending on um, the crop you're growing and what pests you're looking for specifically, but I always try and take something to keep records in. So I bring a pen too, and um, I, I mark what I'm finding, where I'm finding it, the date. Um, and also this is good if you wanna draw pictures in case you can't get a picture with your camera or um, you're unsure of, of um, how to represent that pest. So sometimes they're quick and you can't get a picture of them. And that's good too, because then in future years, you can look back and see when you were seeing those pests. Other things I take are this loop. Um, this helps you see smaller insects close up. It's called a jeweler's loop. You can find it on Amazon. Um, I would get about 30X or 40X magnification. And then I take a bottle that has alcohol in it. Um, so I can preserve insects if I'm not sure what they are. I'll take them for later identification and have this um, paintbrush that you can dip in the alcohol and then catch the insect with it so that you kill them and get them before they hop away or run away if they're fast. Um, I also take a baggie in case there are plants that have what looks like a disease and I need that identified. I'll put plant pieces in here and then I take a camera, um, um, preferably with macro options so you can take up close pictures for later identification. Um, and then I also take a beading tray. Um, I don't know if you know what this is, but um, I'll just briefly talk about what it is. You just shake um, plant parts over the beading tray and then you can look at it, look at the contents with a loop to see if there are insects there. Um, you can look at beneficials and pests that way. So let's move on to our main event. Um, we're gonna start with common tomato insect pests. I'll talk about the beet leaf hopper, aphids, and tomato russet mite. And the beet leaf hopper is a pretty small insect. It's about 0.12 inches long, and it's this wedge-shaped, insect. Um, it has a lot of different colors. It could be light brown to light green in the spring, um, tan or mottled in the summer, and the overwintering insect is tan and mottled. So this is kind of mottled with those dark specks and then the tan overall color. Um, and they might also differ in color from one insect to the next. So um, one other distinguishing characteristic about them is that they have this roof-shaped face as opposed to a well-rounded face or a sharply pointed face. Um, and they also don't have any defined spots on their face like some other leafhoppers do. And we don't worry too much about the direct feeding damage they cause, but um, we do worry about the fact that they vector the beet curly top virus, and that's 
um, a problem in Utah vegetables, especially tomatoes. Um, the hosts of the curly top virus are the sugar and table beet, tomato, pepper, cucurbits, and other hosts. A lot of weeds will host this virus, and the major weed hosts of beet leaf hopper are the Russian thistle and the weedy mustards. So um, beet leaf hoppers will get the virus from these weeds and then um, vector them into cultivated crops. So last season, um, curly top virus was severe in vegetable crops, especially tomatoes, so you might have seen it. Um, it's chronic in southern Utah, so it's pretty common there, but more variable in northern Utah. And the beet leaf hopper overwinters in southern Utah and then migrates north um, in the early summer. And as it's migrating, it's feeding on those weeds and picking up the virus as it goes. Um, um, plants will probably be, cultivated crops will probably be infected in the spring or, or later, depending on how long the beet leaf hopper stays in the cultivated areas. Um, so some symptoms, I'm actually going to go back to this picture. Um, you can see this tomato plant, there's something wrong with it. It does have curly top virus. And you can compare it to these healthy plants right next to it. Um, you can see it has chlorotic or yellowing leaves. It's stunted in its growth. Um, the leaves are kind of curled as opposed to more flat, like these healthy tomatoes. And the um, fruit is prematurely ripening and smaller than it should be. So those are some characteristics. And here are some more um, close-up of the leaves being curled. They might look um, thickened or stiff or crisp. And they could have um, purpling veins. Um, other characteristics are, are the small fruits, um, reduced fruit quality and yield, the stunted growth I talked about, and then phloem necrosis if you do a, a cross section of the stem or a linear, a longitudinal section. Um, and then there could be an enlarged or deformed calyx structure on tomatoes, and you'll see that. You can see that right here. Um, that's a little bit harder to distinguish, I think, so the other characteristics are, are better to look for. But um, these top four images are all tomatoes. You can see another characteristic is that um, the infection is sporadic. It doesn't have um, a common pattern to it. Um, so you can see this one plant probably got infected early on and maybe these plants surrounding it got infected a little bit later, but then there's healthy plants all along this row. Um, and here you can see an extreme example of the um, prematurely ripening fruit and smaller fruit than normal and death of the plant parts. Um, also the purple veins here. Um, the most common plants we saw curly top virus in last year were tomato number one, and then um, beans and squash. So this is, these are all beans on the bottom row. Um, you can see the stunted growth, the brown crispy leaves, the chlorotic leaves. Um, these are all squash on the top row now. Um, you can see those brown crispy and chlorotic leaves again. And then on the bottom row are peppers. We didn't see a lot of those in 2016, but they do occur curly top virus does occur in peppers, and they'll have chlorotic leaves and stunted growth again. So um, the infection is sporadic because beet leaf hopper doesn't, um, so its preferred host is sugar beet, but it doesn't distinguish its host type until 45 minutes after feeding. So it can, um, it can spread the virus within as little as one minute of feeding. So while it's hopping around looking for its preferred host, it's spreading the virus as it goes. And that's why you see that random pattern in the infection. Um, I'm going to talk about management with this one. I'm not going to talk about it with all of, all of the insects that I'll mention, but just the ones that are a little bit more difficult to manage. Um, so curly top virus is hard to manage because it's sporadic and unpredictable. You never know how high the leafhopper populations will be and if they'll even be carrying the virus. Um, and insecticides um, targeted toward leafhoppers are not effective. 
Also, once the plant's infected, it, it can't be treated and should be removed. So a lot of time, the primary strategies that you would apply for management aren't effective when there's high pest pressure. So it's something that's good to keep in mind. Um, but some options you do have are to take out infected plants as soon as you notice them so that they don't um, serve as a reserve of the, the um, virus. Uh, you could also exclude leafhoppers with floating row cover. I think this one might be the best option um, depending on how big your um, vegetable production is. It might not be practical for bigger scale productions, but um, if you use it, you'll want to leave it on for the first six to eight weeks of planting and then, or throughout the season if you can. Um, destroy and remove plant debris will help take away those reserves of the virus. Um, there are also some resistive varieties of tomato um, that were tested in southern Utah. Those are Ropac, Rosa, Salad Mester, and Colombian. And then um, beet leaf hoppers tend to like sparsely um, spaced plants and lots of sun coming in. And so it's been said that if you use dense plant spacing and shade your plants, you might be able to avoid them um, feeding on your plants. So now moving on to aphids. Um, they are a small pear-shaped insect, about one-eighth of an inch long. They come in wingless and winged forms. Um, they're often found in dense groups or can be found singly, and they don't move very quickly when they're disturbed. Um, they have this distinguishing characteristic on their tail end. People call them tailpipes, but um, they're called cornicles. And then this pointed tail end is called the cotta. And those might be different lengths or different colors depending on the species. Um, so aphids are common, but they're not very harmful unless they're vectoring a virus. And I'll talk about those viruses in a second. Um, so the four common aphids in vegetables in Utah are the green peach aphid, the potato aphid, the melon or cotton aphid, and the cabbage aphid. Um, the green peach aphid can be green or pink in color, depending on what they're eating and what time of year. And the same is true for potato aphid. And then the melon and cotton aphid is yellow or tan or mottled in color, and they can be darker as well. On this leaf, you can see that there's dark and light aphids on there. Um, and then the cabbage aphid has a pretty distinct look with this waxy gray covering they have over them. It almost looks like a powder sometimes. And their hosts, um, green peach aphid, they all have a pretty extensive host ranges. Um, their fall and spring hosts, though, are peach, apricot, and nectarine. And then in the summer, their hosts are these vegetable crops listed here. The potato aphid has a lot of the same hosts, um, but their fall and spring hosts are wild rose plants or ornamental rose plants. Um, and then summer hosts are similar to green peach aphid. The melon or cotton aphid, um, they have an extensive host range, but many of those are cucurbits during the summer, and then during the fall and spring, um, they are, their hosts are Catalpa and Rose of Sharon. And then cabbage aphid can only survive on coal crops, other mustard family plants, and related weeds. So their fall and spring hosts are coal crop residue and weeds, and then their summer hosts are coal crops. Um, here are some more identifying pictures of aphids. You can see on this left side the winged aphids. They look pretty different, I think, from the wingless form. So it's good to know what those look like. Um, this is a wingless form giving live birth. Aphids can give, can go through sexual or asexual reproduction, and this is asexual reproduction right here. Here's another close-up of the winged aphid. This is a aphid that's been parasitized, which if you see that, it's a good thing for you because that means that a parasitoid has inserted their egg inside of the aphid body, and as it develops, it kills the aphid um, somewhere along the way. And so usually if you see that, the aphid won't be moving. It's just, um, it's dead or dying. And um, eventually the parasitoid will pupate out the backside of the aphid 
and you'll see this bulbous um, aphid mummy with a hole in the back. So if you see this parasitized aphid, just leave it because um, it's going to have some good effects if the parasitoid can um, pupate out and then continue um, laying eggs. So, um, and speaking about biological control, um, I'm not going to go over that a lot because in our third winter webinar in March, Marion Murray is going to talk only about biological control. So she'll go into more depth on these types of control agents. Um, symptoms of aphid feeding will usually be on newer leaf tissue. Um, and um, some of the symptoms are stunted or curled leaves, which if the leaves curl, that can protect them from insecticides. Um, yellowed or distorted leaves, chlorotic leaves, you can see here in this picture, loss of plant vigor, they also secrete a honeydew that's this sticky, clear um, substance that can attract sooty mold. This is sooty mold right here. And they also leave their cast skins behind, so that's another form of identification. Um, this is a close-up of that, and you can see all the little white dots in this picture are those cast skins. So the main thing we worry about with aphids is their virus transmission. Um, there are three main viruses in Utah that they vector. Um, the first is alfalfa mosaic virus. This is an example of what that looks like. Um, and we see that in Utah on tomato, pepper, potato, pea, and bean. Then there's potato virus Y, which we've only seen on potato in Utah, but it can be on tomato or pepper. This is an example of what that might look like. And then there's watermelon mosaic virus. Um, we've seen it on cucurbits in Utah, but it could also be on peas. And these two pictures are examples of what that might look like. On the leaf, it almost looks like herbicide damage. Um, and there might be other viruses that they vector, but these three are the most common. And um, in our next, our second winter webinar next month, Claudia Nischwitz is going to be talking about diseases. So she'll go into more depth on some of these diseases I mentioned today. Um, so next is tomato russet mite, and this is a microscopic insect, so the main way I'll probably de be detecting it is through the symptoms, but first I'll just talk about what it looks like up close. Um, they have cigar-shaped bodies that are tan to pink in color, and um, they're 0.01 inch long, so you need about a 14x hand lens or a microscope to see them. And um, they usually feed on the lower part of the plant, but if the infestation is severe, then they'll move to the upper part. And um, they're abundant during hot, dry weather during the mid and late summer. Um, you can see some of the symptoms right here. The hosts are tomato, eggplant, pepper, potato, and other solanaceous plants, and then their alternate hosts are nightshades and morning glory. So just to mention some of what you're seeing, that's the symptoms right here. Um, it's almost like a deflated stem right here with bronzing or russeting on the surface. And you can see these dying leaves, um, chlorotic leaves, and just overall the plant doesn't look too good. Um, so they have piercing sucking mouth parts. And um, you can see again this sort of deflated look bronzed bronzing and russeting of the surface of stems or leaves and fruit um, the leaves might yellow or curl or fall off and um, fruits might have longitudinal cracks or bronze colorization so i'm going to take a break and ask if there's any questions so far there are no questions at this time okay so i'll, I'll keep going all right, so we'll move on to common cold crop insect pests. Um, I'll talk about flea beetles, cabbage aphid briefly. We already talked about that, but I just wanted to mention it. And then diamondback moth, cabbage looper, and imported cabbage worm. So flea beetles, there are a lot of different species in Utah. Um, so you might see different looking flea beetles, but they have some similar characteristics, which are they're about an eighth of an inch long. So about the size of an aphid. And um, they're small, dark, metallic bodies. They have enlarged hind legs, which you can see in this picture. 
that allows them to jump long distances and they, they quickly jump when they're disturbed. Um, they overwinter as adults under plant debris and soil clods. Um, their hosts are tomato, pepper, eggplant, potato, radish and relatives, cabbage and relatives, beans and herbs. Um, the less tolerant crops though are coal crops like cabbage and, and edible greens and seedlings. You can see this seedling has already lost a lot of leaf surface um, just from from feeding of, of the flea beetles. And they also um, feed on many weeds. So symptoms, you can see they cause the shot hole feeding in the leaves um, or shallow pits that cause some tan coloring of the leaves. Um, and they feed on the cotyledons and stems as well. Like I said, seedlings are at most risk for damage. Um, the larvae feed on roots, but that's usually not a problem, unless you're talking about tuber flea beetles, which can be a problem in potatoes. Um, so they also can leave frass behind. You can kind of see that in this picture, the dark dots that they leave behind. So those holes and frass will reduce the marketability of your crops. Um, so now moving on to cabbage aphid, just wanted to say it's really common in coal crops in Utah, and it's just some quick ways to manage. You want to um, till or rogue in all your um, hosts like Brussels sprouts or cabbage and kale in the fall to destroy their winter egg hosts. Um, avoid excess fertilization. Um, you could use row covers or reflective mulches, and just try to maintain healthy, vigorous plants overall. So now, diamondback moth, cabbage looper, and imported cabbage worm. These are all caterpillars of uh, vegetable crops. Um, and in Utah, these are the three main caterpillars of um, cabbage and mustard family plants. And um, the injury they cause is similar, and um, their management is similar as well. But the diamondback moth is the primary caterpillar pest in commercial brassica crops, but um, then cabbage looper and imported cabbage worm are more common in home gardens. Um, so this on the left side is the diamondback moth. Its adult is a moth. Um, this is the cabbage looper in the middle. Its adult is also a moth. And then this is the imported cabbage worm on the right. It's adult is a butterfly, and you might see these butterflies hovering over your crops during the summer. Um, it's also known as the cabbage white butterfly. So um, just to go over the identif identification of each of these more specifically, um, diamondback moth has a, a small egg that's yellow, laid singly or in clusters on the undersides of leaves. They're pretty hard to see. Um, but you might see the larvae, which are about 0.5 inches long. They're gray to green, and they don't have any stripes on their body. They wiggle vigorously when they're disturbed, and they might um, drop from a leaf by um, a silken line of, of their silk that they attach to the leaf by. You might have seen that before. Um, and... Um, the pupa has this loose mesh cocoon over it. You might see that on plants as well. And it's about 0.3 inches long. They pupate on the leaves. And then the adult moth has about a 0.75 inch wingspan. They have this distinct upward turning um, tail end of their, uh, of their wings. And then they have sort of a diamond shape on along the back um, so those white cream markings and they're active at dusk and dawn so you might not see them as much as you will see the larva or pupa um, they're migratory in the north but they live in the south and they overwinter in trash and debris around crop fields and there's about four to six generations per year um, their hosts, they exclusively attack brassica family plants, and they prefer cabbage and broccoli, but will feed on others as well. Um, the symptoms, they're going to be similar to the other ones, but they 
they chew holes through the leaves or they cause this um, window pane um, on the leaves where the, the bottom layer of the leaf is still intact, but it looks kind of like a window pane. And then the primary damage is on the outer leaves of older plants, but the larva will also feed on flower buds and floral stalks, and they could be present in heading vegetables inside of the heads and stems at harvest, which can reduce the marketability of the crop. So this is cabbage looper. Um, its egg is a little bit easier to see. It's a little bit bigger. Um, Dome-shaped with ridges on the side. You can only see those ridges if you have a, a loop or a microscope. Um, so they're laid singly or in clusters. And the larvae arch their body into this loop. That's a characteristic of theirs. Um, they have a few sparse hairs on their body, and they're about 1.5 inches long when they're the full length. And then the pupa have this fuzzy cocoon, and this is what the pupa look like. Um, and then the moth adult, it's active at night, so you might not see it, but um, if you do, it has this distinguishing silver eight on both sides of its wings. And the wingspan's about 1.5 inches long. So they're migratory, but there are some residents, and they overwinter as pupa on leaves and plant debris in, and in the soil. They have one to three generations per year. And similar, um, similar symptoms on their host plants. Their host plants are brassicas, beet, celery, cucumber, squash, spinach. So they have a little bit more, they have a wider host range. Now, imported cabbage worm, they have a very distinct egg, I think. It's a little bit easier to spot than the other two as well. It's this rocket or bullet shape that has ridges alongside. It's about 0.04 inches long, and they're laid singly on the undersides of, or, or top sides of leaves. And the larvae are more hairy than the other two. Um, they have stripes along the sides and top of their body. Hard to see in this image, but um, um, they do have that. And they're about 1.2 inch long, and they're sluggish when they're disturbed. So not not quick to move like the other two. Um, the pupa is this naked chrysalis here, and then um, the adult is this white butterfly that has those two dots or one dot, depending on if it's male or female, on both sides of their wings. They have about a two inch wingspan and they're active during the day, so you'll you'll see these a lot more commonly than the other adults. And they're about three to four generations per year. They're resident, so they overwinter as pupa on leaves and sometimes debris. So their hosts, they exclusively attack brassicas as well and related weeds. Um, so then the symptoms are similar um, as the other two. So just a little bit about management. Um, you can interplant with unrelated plants. That might not be practical for larger production systems, but another important thing is to start with clean transplants. Make sure you don't have any eggs on your transplants. Um, you can use row covers to prevent adults from laying eggs on your crop, and then just remove the row covers at harvest, so keep them on all season. Um, you can also hand pick and destroy the larva if that's practical for your production size. Um, you could try planting early um, or use early maturing varieties. Remove plant debris because that serves as a place for overwintering eggs. Um, plant tolerant varieties and then there's a biological insecticide called BT or Bacillus thuringiensis. Um, that is that and Spinosad are both highly effective against caterpillars if you choose to use a spray. And then there are many natural predators. Um, these are just a few, but there's the ground beetle, the paper wasp, and the, um, the lacewing larva, and then ambush bug. Okay, so moving on to common squash and pumpkin insect pests. We'll talk about squash bugs and spider mites. Squash bugs are a common enemy to all growers. <laughs> 
they're pretty prolific and very much a nuisance pest. Um, so the eggs are like this football shape and sort of a brown, bronzy color. Um, they're lighter when they're first laid, but then they darken as time goes on. Um, and they're laid in clusters on the undersides of leaves in about 15 to 40, groups of 15 to 40. And then newly hatched instars have this green or gray body with red, um, red appendages. And as they grow, their appendages become dark and their bodies become more gray green. And they start to look more like the adult until the fourth and fifth instar. They'll develop wing pads. You can barely see those wing pads in this picture. Um, and they look a little bit more like the adult. Here's the adult with its dark, um, dark body and wings folded over a flat back with brown to gray coloring and orange stripes along the abdomen and underside. So their hosts are all cucurbits. Um, pumpkin and squash are most attractive. Um, Hubbard and yellow squash are particularly attractive. Um, cucumber, melons, and gourds are a little less attractive. Um, and the symptoms, they'll congregate on the lower part of the plant. They'll cause um, speckled leaves or chlorosis or yellowing of plant of leaves which you can see here um, necrosis which is this browning or dying of the plant leaf tissue um, the injury occurs on the leaves and vines Wilt wilting might occur on heavy um, feeding you can see that wilting right here and you can tell that there's a lot because there are maybe four clusters of eggs just on this one leaf um, they can also cause scarring on fruit or sunken corky areas that reduce the marketability and can also increase the chance of fruit rot during storage. So some management tactics are to remove um, vines and till the soil in the fall to reduce overwintering adult populations. Also remove debris at the base of plants and avoid using mulch. Um, in small plantings, you can crush the eggs or hand pick the bugs one to two times a week during June in northern Utah, maybe a little earlier in southern Utah. And then um, there's also a biological agent, this feather-legged fly, Trichopoda pinnipes, um, which is a squash bug-specific parasitic fly. Um, it won't do all of the management for you, but it definitely helps. And this is a picture showing an example of an egg um, on the squash bug, and the squash bug died because of this um, parasitic, parasitic fly, and then this is the pupa that came from, from that egg. Um, so uh, there are some insecticides you can use, like diatomaceous earth at the base of plants, kaolin clay, or surround is the brand name, once per week when the nymphs are active. It's important to target the nymphs um, because you'll, you'll have a lot better time managing those than the adults. Also other insecticides are acetamiprid, bifenthrin, esfenbalerate, permethrin, and these listed here. So moving on to spider mites, these are a really small insect that um, are difficult to see, but once you learn what they look like, you can start spotting them, especially if you know the symptoms. Um, so they're about 0 0.02 inches in diameter, and they're translucent to opaque, but the two spotted spider mite will have, um, on this close-up, you can see they have these dark spots on either side. That's where they get their name. And um, this picture is nice because you can see their size in relation to an aphid. Um, so they're pretty small, and this right here is one of a spider mite egg, and there's a spider mite egg there as well, and then you can see these younger spider mites along with the bigger ones. Um, one way to, to tell if there are spider mites there is if you have like a paper or, this, or a book that you bring along, or if you have a beading tray, you can, you can take the leaf, turn it so that the underside faces the paper, and then kind of flick the leaf so that um, the spider mites, if they're there, will drop onto the white paper. And then you watch it, it just looks like, could even look like specks of dirt, but if they're moving around, 
then it's pretty likely that those are spider mites. That's a good way to detect them if you don't have a, a loop or a microscope at hand. Um, so let's see. The adult females overwinter in protected sites on the ground, like crop debris and weeds. And they have eight or more generations per year, and their generations are pretty big, so um, they can invade a crop pretty quickly. So um, spider mites will create this webbing on their host plants. You can see that in this, this picture of this bean, and you can see that those little tiny dots, the little tiny white dots are the spider mites. And there's some browning on this be bean that shows the damage. And then there's some... Um, some silvering of leaves that they feed on. Their hosts are bean, cucurbits, tomato, eggplant, corn, carrot, all these hosts listed. And like I said, those symptoms are those fine stippling or small spots on the upper surface of leaves. They could have a bronze or brown leaves when injury is severe, and that webbing is another symptom. And then wilting or deformed leaves, leaf drop, and eventually plant death if if the infestation is heavy so moving on to corn earworm i'm going to go pretty quickly because i just want to make sure there's time for questions um the eggs are really small they're half the size of a pinhead this is a close-up of the eggs and these are the corn silks right here so you can get an idea of how small they are um, the larva, they have green, black, or brown bodies with um, dark and light stripes running along the length of the body. They're about 0.1 or 1.5 inches long. Um, this is the pupa. And then the adult is a tan brown moth with dark spots on the front wings and then dark margins on the front and back wings. Um, male moths have green eyes. Um, the symptoms, they strongly prefer corn. That's probably where you'll see them the most. Um, their other hosts are tomato, cabbage, cucumber, pumpkin, all these hosts. And then um, the symptoms, they cause damage by directly feeding on kernels, but they also feed on silks, which can reduce the corn ear fill and they can contaminate the ear with their bodies and frass, and then that can attract mold. And then they open up the ear by feeding um, to other pests like earwig and sap beetle. So this is just a, a graph of their um, life cycle. You can see there's a small generation um, in the early summer, and then the, gener the biggest population is this first summer generation in around August 15th or 20th. This is a graph for northern Utah. So in southern Utah, the moth flight begins about three to four weeks earlier, and there can be a fourth generation as well. They overwinter as pupa in the soil, primarily in central and southern Utah. And they, like I said, have typically three generations or four generations in southern Utah. And they lay their eggs on the fresh corn silks, and then um, once the, par the larvae come out, they crawl into the ear tip to feed. And a huge, um, huge thing for corn earworm is monitoring. Um, you use this heliothis trap with a pheromone lure placed at the bottom of the trap. There's a really great video on how to set up the trap if you're new to that um, on YouTube. Um, it's I, I hope. Ohio State IPM program that did that video. Um, so you want to monitor, in, you start in early June and place the trap along the edge of the cornfield. And um, you'll want to check, uh, let's see, I think it's every two weeks. Let's see. Just check twice weekly until the first catch and then check daily for best re results. And then you calculate the average number of moths caught per night. And then you follow the threshold guidelines that I have on this next page. So you, um, you don't apply insecticides if your average number per night is less than 0.2. And you only wanna treat when silks are actively growing. Um, and then if you have higher numbers, then these are your intervals between sprays. So 0.2 to 0.6, you'd wait five days in between each spray. 
and then it goes in the days lesson as you get more moths, more average number of moths per night. And then you want to make sure you stop sprays when the silks turn brown. And, and because of that, you'll be moving the traps to where fresh silks are silking. Um, you can also plant resistant corn like Country Gentleman, Stay Gold, Golden Security, and Silver Gent. There are also the option of planting the corn early to escape most of the injury, which would be around before um, that high that high population size in summer, so that'd be before July 20th or August 5th. Um, clothes pins can also be placed at the bottom of the silks to keep, um, to keep worms out of the ear. Um, that might not be practical for larger productions, but maybe on smaller, a smaller scale. Fall tillage, where the pupae overwinter is important. Um, Using trap crops to lure corn earworm could help. And then there are biological controls, natural predators and parasitoids. There's also a trichogramma wasp that's an egg parasitoid of corn earworm that you could release. And um, like I said, hopefully Marion will, will talk about that in hers. So our last one, I'm actually not gonna talk about leaf miners. Um, and actually there were thrips as well, but I want to leave some time for questions. So if you have questions about thrips, we can talk about them, but let's open it up to questions. Okay, great. Um, we've got a few, some, uh, someone in chat ask, um, uh, um, how, how do you, how do you get rid of the flea beetle? Okay. So flea beetle management. Um, one option is to use row covers and um, there are other options, and if you want, you can email me. I'd have to look them up to um, to tell you those, so you can email me about that if you want to learn more. Okay. Uh, Priscilla says she missed the first few minutes, and she asked if you had talked about apple tree pests. No, so we're not covering fruits in these webinars. Um, I, I focus on vegetables, but Marion Murray, um, if you want to email me, I can give you her information. She has... She has webinars on fruit pests, so um, we could do okay. that. Someone says, "How how how can we protect? Um, how can we protect the vegetables? Uh, when when to spray? Uh, what to spray? And how often?" Um, for which insects is that? Yeah, he didn't say specifically. Um, let's see, that was uh, Hosen. I'm not sure if I'm getting your name right, but if you maybe put in chat maybe which which vegetables uh your what specific vegetable you're referring to with regard to spraying and and how often and what specific insect and um, what specific insect too so um i was just going to say that's one important thing about identifying the insect pests is that that'll help you make decisions on what what you're going to apply if you're going to use an insecticide or if you can use other methods. So, so there's no one spray that just, just, just will just kill all bugs? No, and if there were, <laughs> it wouldn't be very good for it, it the would be great. It would be wonderful. <laughs> it? Um, Don in chat says, are watermelons susceptible to circubit pests? To curcubit? Yes, uh -huh. watermelons are a cucurbit crop. Okay. Okay. Uh, let's see. Lisa says favorite sources of row covers for home gardeners. Um, so Reme is a popular brand of row cover. Um, sources, I'm not sure about that. So you could email me and I could um, I could look some up. So if you want to do that. Okay. Um, someone asked about the webinar. I'll go ahead and put that in chat, the recording. So I'm putting the learn event inside uh, inside chat and so the recording a link to the recording will be available at that link um within a couple of days i think someone else asked about slides um what i'll do is have cami uh, uh give me a copy of the slides and i can also make those available if there's a uh there's an event material section inside that learn event and i'll make the slides available on on that on that same on that same link okay. uh brent Sounds says good. Uh, root root maggot bio control. Um, I'm not sure on that one, so he can email me and I'll look that up and give him some options. 
Jeff's asked, can the webinar be watched again? It can, and we encourage you to share it uh, with your friends. Uh, Hoston came back and said, in general, about spraying. So I guess just just like you said, you need to probably need to identify the insect, mm -hmm. and uh, based on that, and the vegetable uh, or crop, I guess, uh, yeah. based on that, that'll dictate how often and what you want to spray. And real quick, can I just um, give everyone these resources? Sure. Um, so utahpest.usu.edu is our um, site. We have a lot of fact sheets and video fact sheets that give information on a lot of different pests. Um, also, the IPM advisories are helpful. They give um, updated information during the, the growing season of, of what's active and how to manage them. So email me if you want to sign up for that, okay. um, or you can sign up online. I'm going to put that link in chat, folks, so you've got that, so you can just click Thanks. there. Um, let's um, see what else we've gotten. Go ahead, have you got more? Yeah, just also another thing I do, um, if you're looking for a specific pest information on that, you can Google the pest name and then USU, so corn earworm USU, see if we have any resources on those re um, results. And if not, you can do corn earworm extension and then look for other um, university extension information. And then one real quick, um, if you find a pest or um, you think you have a disease and you're not sure what it is and you do want identification, you can send samples for seven dollars to the utah plant pest diagnostics lab there's information on our website about that um, that can be really helpful if you're looking to manage something but you're not sure what it is and then we have this um, vegetable production guide you can email me if you want the link to that okay. cynthia ask about getting a copy of this, this presentation again cynthia that's uh, all that'll be available at the learn link learn.extension.org i put in chat uh, Elizabeth says, what's the best management for leaf miners? Um, for leaf miners, I'd have to look that one up as well because they feed inside of the, the leaf. So they'd be, um, they wouldn't um, be able to be treated with sprays. Um, but I think you can use row covers for leaf miners so that they, the adult won't lay the egg on your crop to begin with. That's probably... The main thing I can think of, but if you want to email me about that, um, I can give you some more ideas. Okay. Uh, Meredith says, uh, Reme floating row cover are readily available online for larger pests like moths and squash bugs. You can use uh, tool, tool, tool for fabric from a fa fabric store. So I guess more of a comment than a awesome. question. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, some of you guys have more experience with, with that kind of stuff, so yeah. thanks for adding in. And then uh, Brenda just mentions, I guess, a plug for the county extension office, too, that uh, if you have questions, I think, uh, yeah, what, whatever county you're, you're located in. I'm assuming Utah yeah. County down, down south. I know I saw a lot of Spanish Fork and Provo and those folks, um, although is Spanish Fork in Utah County? Yeah. That may be. Is mm -hmm. it? Okay. So, yeah, yeah. so I'm sure... Utah County Extension Office would, would love to have calls from, from folks. Yeah, and any county extension agent would be happy to help you ID as well. If you if you can't get up to Logan where the diagnostics lab is or um, if you just want to go in and see them in person. Brenda, feel, feel, feel free to throw your you guys' number in, in chat there if, if you'd like folks to have quick access to it. Um, okay, that's all the questions right now. Uh, awesome. We'll hang out for a bit. We've still got 10 minutes to, technically, so we'll give folks uh, a minute or so to ask uh, more questions if, if they have. Thank you, Brenda, uh, for everyone online. If you turn your attention to chat, Brenda has the uh, local extension office number there. Um, I, I, you know, I was thinking about aphids. I actually grow, uh, so I'm in Asheville, North Carolina. Of course, we're, we're big beer. We're, we're, it's a big, big beer mm -hmm. town here, and I do a lot of home brewing. I actually grow some of my own hops, okay. and aphids are often a problem with hops. Um, mm -hmm. I was told ladybugs eat aphids. Is that yes. true? Yes, it is. So, so my next question is, how do you get ladybugs, like, onto your hops or onto your plants? Is there, um, is there something to draw little ladybugs in? You can order ladybugs online. Oh, um, really? Yeah, sounds kind of crazy, but yeah. they come, um, you can keep them in the fridge to keep them from, mm. uh, I guess it kind of just pauses their 
their life cycle. Sure. Um, and then you release them. I got you. So uh, the adults and the larva are um, predaceous. So both adults and ladybug larva are, are good. The only problem I have is I have the ladybugs inside the house, which I don't want. So I don't know how to separate um, those two. But um. yeah, and they can they can also if it's an open field, the ladybugs might not stay in that one area. Mm -hmm. So they're more effective in like a greenhouse. And uh, gotcha. But, but gotcha. still good to encourage. So. Sure. Okay, we got a few more questions in Q and A. Uh, 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 someone asked, Will. Spinosad, spinosad work on leaf, leaf, leaf miners. Um, I'm not sure about that because again, they're feeding in between layers of the leaf. So if you spray the leaf, it's not gonna, it's not gonna kill them. So um, you, you'll have to email me about that because I, you might be able to treat the eggs, but I'm not sure. I need to look into that. Yeah, and someone makes a comment: leaf miners may be pesticide resistant, only have one parasitoid and then there's a, mm -hmm. a, a nice scientific name there that I'm not even going to try to uh, pr <laughs> uh, pronounce. Um, let's see. Yeah, so, um, I was just going to mention one thing that encourages the biological control like those parasitoid wasps or flies is um, not using broad spectrum insecticides. So um, the more you can avoid insecticides, the more you can build those populations of of natural control so okay uh hillary great great comment on ladybugs in in chat thank you for that uh priscilla says uh i'm seeing these squash bugs now often coming in into the house mm -hmm. um do, does that mean that we need to do some type of uh, sterilization or something to kill them before planting what would you recommend um, well, I recommend targeting the nymphal stage. Um, that's your best op option for control, but they're just a difficult insect to control. And I think pretty much no matter what you do, um, if their populations are big, you can't, you can't really control them totally, but you can try and reduce their population size. So okay. they're a difficult one. Um, Meredith put a good link in chat, folks. Uh, she has an email address there if you'd like to email pictures or ask questions. And then uh, Meredith also made a comment about stink bugs that, mm -hmm. um, you know, I guess the bugs mentioned in the previous question might might be stink bugs. Oh, yeah. There, there are types of stink bugs. So there's the brown marmorated stink bug. <laughs> Looks very similar to squash bug. So people get those confused. I thought that, in fact, when you were, I, I'm not a, I, folks can probably tell from the way I'm asking some of these questions. I'm not mm -hmm. a, I'm not in the biz or I don't work. I'm not a, a gardening. I do have a little garden, but, mm -hmm. but I noticed that I think the squash bug looked, looked like a stink bug to me. Yep. A lot of people get them confused and um, they're similar too, because they're both nuisance pests in that mm -hmm. they, they come into the home. Mm -hmm. um, depending on where you are, uh, Brown marmorated squash bugs aren't as big as they are in all, in some other states, but they're they're growing, so you might see those too. And one thing you can do with them, and this might work for the plant or the squash bug as well, is you can set out a dish of soapy water with a lamp shining on it overnight, because hmm. they're attracted to that heat. And then when they crawl into the dish of soapy water, the soap acts as a surface it breaks the surface tension and then they, they drown. So um, that's an option. I've never tried it. I don't know. I don't know how well it works for, for um, squash bugs, but it's something I heard that works for stink bugs. That, that's what I was going to ask. I assume that's why you stink bugs come inside the house. And I guess maybe ladybugs too is just heat. Yeah. That's where they overwinter is in the house and, and under logs and other protected areas, but they like homes, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. <laughs> especially old older homes that are not very that not very well insulated <laughs> yeah mm -hmm. if there's some <laughs> cracks is, on the outer yeah, yeah they have, come yeah, in we, through the eaves and stuff so. yeah ours is built my old farm home built in 1931 so it's 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 great and it's got a lot of uh character yeah. but that's one of the uh downsides of it i so. know i love those older homes <laughs> but yeah because you got to take the good with the bad mm -hmm. okay folks we'll take uh just another minute or so and uh build any 
questions last last chance so cammy when is the next um uh, i'll find so, a link and i'll put it for the next webinar when is uh, yeah. what's the title of the next webinar y'all are doing next webinar is the pest study crash course part two it's the um common diseases of vegetable crops that's going to be claudia nishwitz she's our extension plant pathologist um and that'll be just identification and and management i think too of mm -hmm. diseases and what's and the uh, what's the date on that the date is february 16th at 10 a.m february 16th yeah. i'm gonna pull that up and i'll send out some some flyers on that when it gets closer to the date okay. as well good so. and so i'm gonna put that link in chat folks um feel free to go ahead and register for that there's a registration link inside this learn event you can go ahead and register and uh the advantage of that is you'll get an email reminder uh one day and one hour prior to the uh, yeah. webinar uh randy asked can we get ceus for these yes webinars? oh thank you for asking that so um each webinar is worth one ceu pesticide use management credit and just email me if you want one of those, and I'll send you the certificate. Thanks for asking about that. Uh, Kelly, you said 10, and I think it's going to be, uh, so it'll be 10 a.m. The next webinar will be 10 a.m. Uh, yes. Mountain time? Mountain time, yes, yeah. 10 a.m. Okay. And that's the third webinar is at 10 a.m. as well. So. Yeah, so that'd be 12 for us on the East Coast, although this is yeah. Utah folks. So, um, Cammie, if you remind me, I'll, yeah, remind me in an email. We can add a CEU. We can put that in the registration oh, awesome. for too many folks, and that's just a nice way to, to gather it. So, yeah. uh, okay, bug me in there. Um, Cammy, can you? Would you mind putting your email inside chat? You've mentioned that a few times, and uh, yeah. I think a couple of folks have asked for it. Why don't you put it's that on in this chat? slide. If, if you're still looking at the slides, but I'll put it in chat. Is that where you want me to put it? Yes, please. Okay. It's just a nice folks can maybe copy and paste it from there. Mm -hmm. Okay. Let's see if I remember how to get to chat. <laughs> uh, it's um, since you're sharing a screen it's going to be up top the toolbar is moved up top and then I think there's a, a dot 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 maybe there more or more oh yes you want to click is. thank you okay so cami.canon at usu dot dot edu and for those who were looking for fruit webinars um, marion.murray at usu dot edu she does fruit webinars. Um, I'm not sure what her plans are for this winter, but she's a good contact for fruit pests. So. Okay, I think that's all we have. Cami, it's been a pleasure. Thank you. Uh, it's been a pleasure for me too. Thanks yeah, everyone and, for joining. Yep, and we'll see everyone in a couple weeks. Awesome. Sounds good. Right, Thank bye -bye. you. Bye.